this is the first Sunday of Lent, and Lent, as I had said in the pastoral prayer, is not a biblical mandate. It is a human construction constructed originally by the by the church uh, many many years ago, and we celebrate uh, Lent and we use it as a time to prepare. Uh, for celebrating, for first of all, remembering the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ and all that was instituted during Holy Week. We remember Palm Sunday, we remember Maundy Thursday, we remember Good Friday, we remember Saturday, the day of silence as our Lord lay in the tomb. And then we remember the glorious physical resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ that we call Easter or Resurrection Sunday. I've been in pulpit ministry since 1976. Now there were some times that I stepped away from the pulpit momentarily. I served on the mission field for three years, sold computers for two, was unemployed for two, worked at Rhodes Grove for four. But aside from that, from, from those years, I have been in pulpit ministry since 1976. And as we prepare for Lent, the emphasis on Lent is more on Good Friday, the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ, rightfully so. Because if Jesus Christ had not died on that cross, we would not have the provision as Jesus became the propitiation for our sins, as a ransom for many. If Jesus had not died on that cross, our opportunity to be saved, our opportunity to have a relationship with God would have been non-existent. And so rightfully, during Lent, we emphasize Good Friday. But as I have done that since 1976, I would like to emphasize in this season of Lent, I would like to emphasize Holy Week not only as a time of reflection, not only as a time of repentance, but also a time of celebration. Because there was this amen that happened at the end of Holy Week. And that was when our Lord Jesus Christ physically rose from the dead and walked out of that tomb. He defeated death and the grave. His Father resurrected him. And because of that, we also will have a resurrection. So I would really like to emphasize the celebration of Easter, as well as all the sober reality of Good Friday. And what I would like to do is I pondered how I would like to do that. I came on my understanding that, you know, we as Christians have a tendency to compartmentalize and put into drawers the stories of the Bible. But there is this consistent whole that goes through all of scripture from Genesis to Malachi in the Old Testament, from Matthew to Revelation in the New. And so from Genesis to Revelation, we have this consistent theme. And what is this theme? You know, we can compartmentalize. We, we speak of the creation and the wonder of the power of God as he brought all of the universe into being. <coughs> We talk of the fall of man when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden and their expulsion and how the stain of Adam and Eve have followed down the corridor of human history. We talk about the flood. We talk about the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We then talk about Joseph as a type of Christ. Then we talk about the flight from Egypt because the Hebrews were enslaved for 400 years under the Pharaohs. And then they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years because of the hardness of their hearts. But then under the leadership of Joshua, there was the conquest of the Holy Land. And then we come into the time of the kings, Saul and David and Solomon who was the greatest king who ever lived. But because of the hardness of their hearts, God 
rendered into them prophets. Not to foretell the future. The, pro name, the purpose of the prophets was to re a cry for repentance and to bring them back to Yahweh. And because they did not listen, then they were taken captive into Babylon. They returned to the Holy Land. And then for 400 years, we have what we call the period of silence when God did not speak through prophets or through anyone else. For 400 years, the Holy Land had a very rich history of wars and other uh, situations, but God did not speak. The Shekinah glory had left the temple, but then after 400 years, as prophesied in the Old Testament book of Daniel and many of the prophets, came the birth of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. We then speak of his three years of ministry, and then we go into Palm Sunday. We talk of Holy Week and all the events that happened there, the institution of communion, which we will be celebrating today. And then Christ's crucifixion, his physical resurrection, and then his physical ascension to where he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. The birth of the, of the Christian church in the book of Acts. Paul's missionary journeys and all the letters that he wrote. And then we have the promise of Christ's physical return. And finally, the new creation. When our Lord Jesus Christ will create a new world, a new universe for us to live in that does not know what sin is. We have a tendency that when we study these, we break them into individual drawers or compartments. But there is this consistent story that goes throughout the entire Bible. And if you read the Bible intelligently, you will discover that the Bible is incurably Christocentric. That's a big $10 word, meaning that it centers on Christ. No matter what book that you study, from Genesis to Revelation, it is all about the Lord Jesus Christ. Our first messianic prophecy is in Genesis chapter 3. When, Paul, when God speaks to the serpent, and curses him and says, you shall bruise the heel of man, but he shall crush your head. And that was a messianic prophecy of what Christ was going to do 4,000 years later, because when Jesus Christ physically rose from the dead, that was the crushing of the serpent's head. We see in the fall of man, the promise of a kinsman redeemer, we see in the flood how God preserved a holy remnant. We see the faith of the patriarchs. And we see how Isaac and Jacob and even Joseph serve as types of Christ because of the lives in which they led. And their lives are faint echoes of the God-man who is to come. The fact that he redeemed his people from the pharaohs in Egypt and brought them out. The fact that he cared for them as they returned to the Holy Land. And then, of course, we get into the life of Christ itself, himself. But the most important thing for us to remember is that the life of Christ, you can't break into separate segments. You have to look at the whole of the life of Christ as you have to look at the whole of scripture. You've heard me use the illustration that at the crutch scene where the manger was that the shadow of a cross fell upon it. But shadows can only be originated by light. Where did the light come from? So if the shadow of a cross is falling across the manger, where is the shadow coming from? It's the light of the empty tomb. And again, you can't stop. You can't end the story of Christ there. You have to go to his physical ascension, his promise that he is going to return. His promise is that as he ascended into heaven, the angels that came to witness that and to witness to the apostles who saw our Lord Jesus Christ physically ascended into heaven. 
They said, as you saw him leave, in the same way you're going to see him return. So we do believe at some point, our Lord Jesus Christ is going to return to this earth. We may disagree on how he's going to do it. We can't disagree on when he's going to do it, but we can't predict when he's going to do it. He could do it. He could return within the next moment. I might not be able to end this sermon because our Lord Jesus Christ may return. Or if it pleases him, he may not come for another hundred years. No man knows the day or the hour. Beware of those who tell you when Jesus Christ is going to return. Beware of them. Nobody knows. There is no mathematical formula. There is no secret knowledge. Scripture makes it painfully, purposefully clear that nobody knows the day nor the hour, not even our Lord Jesus Christ himself. Only the Father knows when he will tell his Son to stand from where he sits at his right hand and return to the earth. And so we have to remember the entire story. And we have to remember that all of it points to the Lord Jesus Christ. When you study the Old, when you study the Old Testament, ask yourself this question. What does this book say about the Messiah? When you study the letters of Paul, you have to ask yourself, what is he saying about the Lord Jesus Christ and what he means to our salvation? Not only of us as individuals, but what does he say about the church? What does he say about the resurrection? What does he say about the physical reappearance of our Lord Jesus Christ? And of course, when you read the book of Revelation, it's all about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, told in very symbolic language that we can we are free to disagree with, but we all agree on one thing, that Jesus Christ shall physically return to this planet. We might be premillennial or postmillennial or amillennial. We might be pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, mid-wrath. I mean, there's all sorts of different positions. I would recommend that you be a pan-millennialist. You're just going to stick around and see how it all pans out. Okay? Or pro-millennialist. Whatever it is, you're all for it. You know? But I would encourage you to study and look at the various ways in which Christianity uh, looks at the Bible. And though we disagree, we do so with courtesy and respect, but we all agree on one thing. No matter the denomination, no matter what millennial position we hold to, we all agree on this, that Jesus Christ is someday going to physically return. And so as we study during the period of Lent, we look from Genesis to Revelation and see that all of it talks about the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 5, 39 to 40, Jesus said, You search the scriptures because you think in that, that, that in them you have eternal life. But it is these that testify about me, and you are unwilling to come to me that you may have life. So Jesus Christ confirmed that the scriptures, when he was talking to the Pharisees, by the way, when he said this, the, the entire Old Testament talks about the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is Peter who affirms this in Acts 3.18. But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets, that as Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. There are so many messianic prophecies, but they're divided into two sections. The first section of the suffering servant, the second section of the reigning king. Jesus Christ already fulfilled the suffering servant. And if he fulfilled all those prophecies, he will certainly come and he will fulfill all the rest. So as we prepare our hearts for the, for the time of Good Friday, when we soberly reflect on the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
Let us also prepare for celebration for Easter because he has risen and he has risen in the game.
Regardless of what kind of tune we sound like in the shower. <laughs> but anyway, this is a thought. I, I enjoy singing in a, a church building that has a lot of reverb and a lot of bounce. Let's continue to worship how deep the Father's love. Thank you. 
they can see. 